Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, presentation. My name is Roman. I work for a company called Pivotal. <clears throat> and today I will be talking to you about you know, a bunch of things, uh, all of them related to Cloud Foundry in one way or another. Uh, but most of them are pretty low level. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, a talk about how we enable something like Cloud Foundry as opposed to like, how do we use something like Cloud Foundry. So this is a plumbing talk here. I'm a plumber talking to you. Uh, my qualifications, you know, before I actually begin, you know, consist of having a single patch in the Linux kernel and, you know, hailing from the Plan 9 community, so I'm fully prepared to discuss any kind of operating system in Toronto. Uh, so why do we all love paths? Uh, well, um, well, actually, this is, this is the kind of paths I like. Uh, uh, but seriously, I mean, if you think about it, PaaS is awesome precisely because it lets us not worry about a bunch of stuff, right? Uh, instead of, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what needs to be started in my data center, you know, how do I need to configure a bunch of things, you know, what pocket recipes do I need to use, all I do is just, you know, CF push. And CF push makes sure that a whole bunch of things happen behind the scenes. Uh, you know, I have these machines somewhere in the cloud. I not, might not even know which cloud, right? You know, all I know is that my Cloud Foundry uh, command line can talk to these machines and the right things happen. Uh, but what is the right thing? Well, the right thing is, you know, I have my application and bits and pieces of that application get blasted onto a data center. They get instantiated and they start coordinating with each other and, you know, some kind of a useful service emerges. And it's all well and good, you know, as long as we're talking about the stateless services. But what about the stateful one? So I also come from uh, the background of big data management, you know, Hadoop uh, sort of ecosystem community. And the way we do stateful in that uh, ecosystem is basically we abstract that state away. So it is a very similar model to what we all use with Cloud Foundry, but with a, one interesting aspect. So at the very bottom of everything, we have this you know, stateful management substrate called HDFS, which is actually consisting of individual services, you know, providing storage capabilities to that substrate. And, and by the way, these services actually happen to be resilient ones. So this is an example of running something like HBase. HBase, you know, for those of you not familiar with it, is, you know, you can think of it as MongoDB in the Hadoop ecosystem. So the way HBase would run in a typical data center is sort of similar to how a CF push would, you know, result in a whole bunch of activity in the data center. Uh, but the only difference being that the services that I'm running on every single node are essentially the servicing doing two things. So first of all, there is a service, you know, abstracting away direct edge storage and making it part of this whole substrate, right, you know, HDFS. But then there is also a service that takes things that now reside in that substrate called individual uh, regions for HBase and, you know, serves them up. So what happens if the, you know, one of the nodes fails? Well, if one of the nodes fail, then the coordination service that also uh, happens to run in the same data center basically detects that the node has failed, rebalances the whole cluster, and by the way, because HDFS is fully replicated, we're not actually losing any data, and by the way, all of these you know, little blocks, little regions that we need to serve up, they're still in HDFS, so the only thing that we need to do is rebalance what service is now serving them. And if the node happens to come back in, uh, an interesting bit of HDFS magic happens that lets you reuse the disk that is now available to the substrate. So bits will be blasted onto that disk, you know, replication will kick in. Uh, but from the standpoint of the services, again, the service basically comes up. It asks a coordination service, what am I? What do I need to do? Give me some work and it starts doing that work. So this to me is both CF push and uh, stateful services and I would actually call this the microservices-based deployments. So people talk about microservices, what it is, what it is, and to me, this is what it is. So you have a bunch of things that are blasted on you, uh, onto individual nodes in your data center. Those things happen to be resilient in the sense that if you kill one, the whole system doesn't go down. And in fact, if you listen to some of the Netflix presentations, they actually do that in their production data center. So they have Chaos Monkey just randomly killing the services to make sure that, you know, if a hardware failure happens, you know, their system still keeps operating. So this to me is the definition of a microservice, doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. Uh, let's actually now ask ourselves a question of how can we build something like this, right? 
So obviously there is a whole bunch of magic, orchestration magic, that happens to make sure that these individual bits of functionality get blasted onto the nodes in the data center. So that is the bit that we will not be talking about. So there is a whole lot of interesting stuff happening at the orchestration level. But at the end of the day, what I'm interested in is once the rubber hits the road, once there is something that needs to be executed on each individual node, what happens then? So let's zoom in, right? You know, let's take an individual node and try to figure out how to best execute a particular bit of functionality on that individual node. So what is the anatomy of the microservice? Well, I would argue that every microservice that we uh, manage looks something like this. So there is obviously sort of an application layer of the microservice, which typically happens to be a microservice code. So maybe it's your Java code. Then there is some kind of virtual machine, and I don't really mean a, you know necessarily JVM or anything like that. It can be just a virtual machine that you know interprets you know the code that you blast onto the microservice. It could be just a configuration virtual machine. So if you have a configuration you know subsystem, think of it as a virtual machine. Then there's a whole bunch of stuff, and then there's hardware. So let's take a look at what this stuff is. Well, this stuff is actually very annoying. So what this stuff is, it's what we need for the virtual machine to connect back to the bare metal, because it just so happens that we've been conditioned that you know you cannot really run a virtual machine with bare metal. I mean, it's pretty much impossible. So we have to run um, you know some kind of a kernel, maybe Linux kernel. We have to basically manage a whole bunch of packages in the OS image because, you know, apparently JVM has dependencies, so, you know, we have to lay those out carefully. Uh, we have to use something like Puppet or Chef or maybe, uh, you know, some of the other provisioning tools to actually manage those images. Uh, and finally, we end up with this huge VM image that is actually pretty bulky, so it's really difficult to lug it around the data center. Uh, and the question that I ask is, like, is there a better way? So to me, this is, this is actually a way better way. Uh, if any of you at this point are just coming from another exciting conference called DockerCon, hold your thought. I have a slide to talk about what near and dear to you. Here, what I'm talking about is actually not Docker, although it looks quite a bit like Docker. So what I'm talking about here is that, well, why don't we actually reduce the amount of stuff that we have to put in that image to a bare minimum. So what could be that bare minimum? Well, ultimately what I really want to do is I want to run JVM on my bare metal. Uh, well, that would be kind of difficult because, you know, we have a host layer, right? So why don't we then use virtualization technique to actually accomplish that but in a guest sort of VM image? So instead of we using the image or, you know, container that has a full-fledged operating system just for a single purpose of running JVM, why not create just enough, you know, glue to tie JVM back to the hardware. And you know, a friend of mine actually has a good analogy. He's like, well, that would be like LeapC for bare metal. That is exactly what it is. Uh, so hardware, then you have some kind of hardware virtualization assistance you know, solution, be it XAM, KVM, you know, virtual box, you name it. Then you have virtualized hardware that is essentially given to the image, to the entire image of your application. And then your application runs. Now, is there any problem with that? We will actually try to figure that out. But before we do, let me give you a little bit of terminology that I found useful when I was trying to figure out this stuff. And by the way, this stuff uh, is pretty recent in the sense that I kind of sort of gave up on operating system design and operating system research after Rob Pike you know, famously declared that operating system research and system research in general is irrelevant. And I'm like, yeah, Rob, you're right. You know, it's like, I should not stop paying attention. Mm -hmm. But back in 2012, 2013, a whole bunch of interesting things have happened which I actually had no clue about. Because my professor uh, taught me about microkernels versus monolithic kernels, and that was a settled debate, you know, with Linux, like we all know who won. And then it just so happens that my professor, you know, forgot to mention exokernels and nanokernels, but those don't, those don't matter, trust me. What does matter though is unikernels and anykernels. So what are these? So unikernels, basically, to the best of my knowledge, uh, can be traced back to the paper that came out of, uh, I believe, uh, Zen group, you know, roughly speaking. So there's a University of Cambridge that does a bunch of research, and there's like a virtual Zen group that just does stuff with Zen. So at some point, you know, they did this interesting paper on Mirage OS that I highly recommend everybody read called Unikernels Library Operating System for the Cloud. It came out in 2013, and to me it actually defines sort of this space of like, wow, I didn't know that is possible. 
What it basically defined is a library operating system, you know, a novel concept that instead of using a kernel that multiplexes between different uh, processes, basically serving as an uh, arbitrator of hardware resources and processes, they're like, well, why don't we actually have a library that is kind of like a kernel, but in support of just a single application. So there's absolutely no multiplexing between, you know, different uh, user space, you know, processes. Just a single process, same address space, same everything. Very interesting ideas. Uh, any kernels is another such idea that sort of came out roughly at the same time. And any kernel is not even any kind of a kernel. It's actually a programming discipline. It's how you write a kernel. If you write it in a certain way, then you can call your kernel an any kernel. So Linux kernel, for example, could totally be written as an any kernel. Uh, it is difficult, so the only implementation of the any kernel today happens to be in that BSD, but I highly recommend reading this uh, thesis by Andy Kanti, which defines how to write a kernel in such a way that you can reuse implementations for all the bits and pieces that comprise a modern kernel. So you can extract, let's say, TCP IP step and plug it into your application without changing you know, much at all. So with that bit of terminology set up, let's actually look at something that is truly exciting for me. Because you know, all of the stuff that I've talked about so far is research, right? You know, it's nice and dandy and you know generates papers and I guess you know provides tenures. But at the end of the day, I am a technologist, so I want to run something, and I would like that something to be maybe back and for Cloud Foundry. So I'd rather have something that people are actually seriously considering for production use. And it wasn't until, I would say, last year uh, that I was just like, well, there's nothing happening in that space that would be productization of all these ideas. And I think it was last year when I first met uh, guys sort of behind this project called OSV. Uh, so they form a cloudy system, and you know, two of them are present here, so Dor is sitting right here, and Don is sitting right there. And if you have any questions you know, that are deep and meaningful, they are way better people to answer them. Uh, I'll just give you the overview. Uh, Not sure. <laughs> Uh, but they are, they, are, you know, they are the group that is actually standing behind OSV, and they are actually the company that stands behind the OSV. And that is very different you know, compared to all the previous attempts of doing something like this. So let's very quickly look into what OSV is and why it's so relevant to microservices architecture. So I'm not sure whether Dora would agree with me, but if I were to explain OSV in a single sentence, I would actually say that the unikernel for POSIX-like applications and it is best suited for the memory managed applications. I will explain why it makes sense, at least to me, uh, but that's what it is. So it, act, it is actually also has some of the any kernelish features, because you know, if you look into how OSV is implemented, and by the way, OSV is not a derivative of any existing kernel. So it's not a Linux derivative, it's not a BSD derivative, it's a written from scratch, you know, bunch of code. But it also leverages some of the existing technology, for example, ZFS for file system management, and the way that it leverages ZFS is any kernelish like, because they don't actually re-implement ZFS, you know, the way that Linux, for example, tries to. They actually leverage it from uh, OpenSolaris, uh, I believe, uh, and it's kind of like a code import that is very much any kernelish in nature. So they're trying not to get into, you know, like managing ZFS bits themselves. So it runs on top of KVM, Zen, VirtualBox, VMware. In fact, it's running, you know, right now and will run uh, on my box right here. And to the host OS, it looks like just a regular application. Your image, your sort of linked image, looks just uh, like an application. Uh, so from the paper that uh, Claudius guys uh, have published, or not yet, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, next, is yes. next week. Next week, yeah, yeah. So next week there is a paper coming out, which again, I highly recommend, you know, keep an eye on it. But I was given a preview of the paper, so here's the stuff I stole from it. Uh, so this is OSV Manifesto. Uh, what do we want from something like OSV? Well, we want them to run existing Linux applications because we really don't want developers to re-architect their applications. We actually want it to run faster. And this is an amazing bit to me because at the end of the day, this is a virtualization-based solution. And the typical question you ask about virtualization-based solutions is like, how much slower would it run? Well, this thing actually runs faster, and I will explain why. So make boot time essentially about the same as exact time. So starting an OSV image would be completely equivalent to just starting a JVM on the machine, right? You know, of the same cost. Uh, explore APIs beyond POSIX because you know POSIX is a little bit constrained. So if we can, you know, lift those constraints, you know, we can get additional performance. 
and stay open. So it is amazingly a very open, open source, you know, community, very welcoming one. Uh, you know, very active development mailing list. You know, all of the development happens on GitHub. I could not have been happier about you know sort of the state of the community. Again, I can't sort of like. My, you know, my job is at ASF, Apache Software Foundation, you know, I typically brag about how good we have it at ASF. OSV is actually a really good open source project. But forget about all of this, you know, let's actually look what's inside. So what's inside, essentially, you get an image, and that image, think of it as static linking. We all know what static linking on Unix is, right? You know, instead of, you know, dynamically getting bits and pieces of the file system, you basically, at a link phase, take all that same bits and pieces, put it into a single image, and that is now a completely independent from anything else on your file system image that can conceptually run on sort of any Linux kernel. Something like that happening here as well, but instead of linking an image that happens to be an executable for Linux, you're actually linking an image that happens to be uh, and executable for KVM or any kind of you know, virtualization solution. It's a full-fledged sort of like virtual OS kind of an image. So inside that image, you basically have C++ kernel code, and uh, it's pretty amazing you know, what OSV does with C++. So like if you're a C++ geek, I definitely recommend you take a look at it. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, all everything, you know, your kernel, your application, all of your libraries, everything sits inside of the same address space. So it's a huge address space, think of it as a single, you know, page, uh, that everything is in there, right, you know. And, by the way, of course, it means if you do point arithmetic uh, incorrectly, you can totally kill the kernel, but it doesn't really matter because, you know, kernel is per application. So if you kill the kernel, what it effectively means is just your application per adopt. Well, that happens to an application from time to time. Uh, again, for managing block storage and for managing uh, networking, uh, there are layers, you know, CFS is for block, uh, and TCP IP stack, which I will get into the details, uh, that I implemented, again, CFS is leveraged, uh, TCP IP stack is implemented from scratch. The actual hardware and devices from your host operating system are being given to the guest operating system through the magic of uh, Prod.io, which is pretty performant. Uh, so it's not like you're emulating everything. You're actually uh, getting quite a bit of leverage from the uh, assisted virtualization. And then there is a bunch of threads, that's it. Just a bunch of threads, you know, some of them are kernel threads, some of them are user threads, there's absolutely no distinction between threads. In fact, the good thing is, your system calls, you know, the, the dreaded system call that we all have been optimizing for, now becomes a library call. There's absolutely no cost, because it's the same address space. Uh, and there's quite an interesting sort of set of optimizations of how we can leverage some of the user space threads to do typically sort of uh, kernel level, you know, uh, work. But that's, that's essentially what you get in, uh, when you compile and link an OSV image. Then you give that image to QM or you know, to Zen sort of thingy, and it just schedules it on your CPU. And at that point, that image has full access to all of the CPU capabilities. And that's actually quite, you know, quite powerful, because at that point, it can use anything that the CPU has without any regard of whether it belongs to a kernel space or a user space, so let's say MMU. So MMU is typically reserved for the operating systems, you know, to manage page tables and whatnot. Here you can actually leverage it in your application. And again, I will show you how uh, OSV guys are leveraging it in uh, optimizing Java. But with all this goodness, is there like absolutely nothing it cannot do? No, there's actually a few things. So first of all, because it's a single uh, unit kernel, there's absolutely no fork allowed, right? Because there is no such concept as forking, and there is no processes, right? You know, it's a single process. Uh, I believe that there are some, you know, ideas uh, about implementing fork outside of the hypervisor, uh, but again, I'm not sure whether that has seen any light of day uh, yet. But today, it's a fair restriction: no forking, uh, no process isolation, because there are no processes. So all of your processes are essentially threads, right? You know, like that's that's the concept, the rough concept, and you know. This is the least amount of drivers, device drivers, you ever have. So, because, you know, ultimately what you want out of your host OS is to be a glorified device driver for your hardware, and then everything that's application specific, you do in the OSV. So, with all this excitement, you know, what's, what's, what's the performance implications? Well, like I said, I mean, quite amazingly, the performance actually improves. Uh, so, on network intensive applications, unmodified applications, and again, you can actually run an unmodified application by statically linking it inside of this, you know, OSV image. Uh, there is one slight catch. 
because everything is done through the dynamic linker, your application needs to be built as a shared object, and it needs to have an entry point. So as opposed to just you know being a you know elf with you know like maybe. Uh, but if you do that on unmodified application, you get you know 25 performance gain throughout, uh, which I believe was measured on memcached. Again, pretty popular, you know, uh, sort of C, C++, not even Java application. 47%, you know, decrease in latency, which is, again, nothing to actually uh, sneeze at. For non-POSIX API use, you know, if you're actually willing to rewrite some of your applications, you get actually quite, quite a drastic uh, performance increase. Uh, on the compute-intensive applications, you know, your mileage may vary, because obviously uh, you are now constrained by the hypervisor, right? And if all that your application does is compute, I don't think you can expect any kind of you know, performance improvements from just about anything. I mean, it's like it's essentially burning CPU cycles. But let's actually very quickly just give you a bunch of previews, right? You know, most of this is pretty deep. So like I can talk, you know, for maybe five, ten minutes about you know each of these slides, and I'm sure again Don and Dor can talk even more. Uh, but let me just very quickly explain to you where this performance improvement comes from. So on the networking side, the biggest uh, reason that we see those numbers is that OSV has a TCP IP stack that is fully optimized for running just a single application in the same address space. In fact, uh, they were one of the sort of few people to implement Van Jacobson's net challenge, which is essentially a pretty simple idea. You know, if you look at a typical uh, TCP IP stack architecture in an operating system design today, you basically have, you know, Packets traversing it in two directions, you know, all the time. So there is one direction from the application side, you know, from the top. Your application can call, you know, send and receive, and then you know, stuff goes down, you know, to the level of interface, network interface. But then there is also, you know, interrupts you know, from the interface itself. So like packets are arriving, and you know, the TCP IP stack needs to be in the business of processing those packets. So you basically have locking because you know it uses common data structure at every single level. So like all these you know, calls are completely sort of totally interacting with each other. Uh, if you implement channels, channels are essentially you get a packet and you basically create a particular channel that is specific to that type of a packet, and you start you know, just shuffling them back into the application, first of all, you reduce locking. So all of a sudden, uh, you just essentially look at a single place rather than you know, multiple places. But second of all, which was amazing to me, because you now reduce the amount of processing that's happening, your packet has a higher chance, actually way higher chance, of not being lost from decache of your CPU. So basically, the way it goes is, you know, you get a frame from the NIC, and by the virtue of acquiring it, you know, and doing some initial processing in it, you know, the data ends up in the decache. And because it's so quick, you know, to traverse that stack in the other direction, the data doesn't actually leave the decache from your CPU, so when the application is about to actually process that data, the data is still cached, so that's another uh, reason that there is quite a bit of performance improvement. Uh, so another uh, optimization is, you know, if you think about memory management from typical Unix, well, you have OS memory that is, you know, segregated between different processes. Within each process, maybe it's JVM, so it has its own heap, okay? So with OSV, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is like, well, now it's a single process, so all of the memory sort of belongs to one single process. But a very cool trick that they do then is, well, but then if all, of your, all that you're running is JVM, let's actually completely flip the relationship between the two. It's called JVM ballooning. So let's actually completely flip the relationship and say all of your memory from now belongs to the JVM, but an operating system has an option of creating an object essentially a completely opaque object that all the JVM knows about, there is a reference to that object, hence it cannot be garbage collected. And at that point, operating system, because again, remember, single address space, very cool. At that point, an operating system can actually use the memory assigned to that object for whatever purpose it needs. So these completely flip the relationship between the memory management inside of a kernel and a memory management sort of in your uh, application. All of the memory belongs to the application, no more X and X. It's just from time to time an operating system would essentially borrow bits and pieces of that memory. Uh, another cool thing that goes back to me talking about CPU capabilities now available to the application, what happens when a reference in Java changes? Well, if you have object one that has a reference to object two, uh, if you basically erase that reference, what you've effectively done, you've modified a bit of memory that belongs to object one. 
And at that point, unless you're actually tracking it through hardware-assisted capability, there is no way for a garbage collector to know that that thing will change. But if you can use MMU, that is typically, again, reserved for managing pages in the operating system, you can actually track it, because now it becomes a hardware event. So anything that's written into that object gets tracked, and at that point you have a way of actually tracking what gets changed, so that garbage collector has an assistance from a table that essentially tracks modifications through the hardware uh, delivered events. I have five minutes left. There's way more cool stuff. But I have to talk about Docker, because not talking about Docker this week would put me in a very awkward situation. Uh, <laughs> This is exactly the same picture I showed you when I introduced OSV, but there are a few changes, right? And now this picture actually does represent Docker. So you still have your new sort of, you know, microservices code, and you still have your you know, virtual machine and whatnot, but instead of the uh, sort of hardware-assisted virtualization layer in yellow, you now have a common shared kernel. So all containers on Docker, on a single host, essentially share the capabilities of the same kernel, just like OSV images share the sort of virtualization capabilities of, you know, Xen or KVM. Now, on top of the shared kernel, what Docker does, Docker basically provides you a layer of uh, essentially jailed file system and virtualized network, you know, that sort of thing. But on top of that, it's kind of like exactly the same. You basically have a statically linked image, but that static linking now happens not at the level of sort of uh, an application itself, but at the level of all the bits and pieces that have to exist in the file system. Is it really just like OSP? Is it different? What is Docker? By the way, what is Docker? Not anybody knows? What, like, a shipping company. Huh? A shipping company. A shipping company. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else, any other suggestions? What is Docker? Yes. What is Docker to you? Because like, I, I, I couldn't figure it out for a long time. Now I think I figured it out. Yes? Standardized packaging and distribution. You have planted man. Tell me, you have planted man. Because that is exactly right. <laughs> that is exactly what it is. Docker is not Linux containers. In fact, Docker leverages Linux containers to accomplish exactly what this gentleman said, to achieve a standardized packaging and distribution infrastructure. So it's like SHA? No. <laughs> it's the new RPM. That's actually good. It's like RPM. Exactly. And the reason it's not like SHA, although it could have been like SHA or Puppet, is the socially driven image sharing. So I started with Puppet way back in 2006, and the whole promise of Puppet over CF Engine back then was that we would all have this wonderful community of recipes shared by everybody. So your recipes would be applicable to my environment, my recipes would be applicable to your environment, we would build off of each other's recipes, there will be this awesome language that would let us, you know, safely extend classes. None of that happened. Again, not that it couldn't happen, it just none of it happened. And to me, this is the quintessential sort of point of a Docker. Docker essentially enables the same thing that GitHub enables. And it's no coincidence that index.docker.io now is renamed into hub, you know, Docker hub, at least in my opinion and so on. So whenever you do Docker run, you're essentially pulling off a bunch of images that other people created. Just like when you do, you know, fork on GitHub project, you're pulling off a bunch of code that other people created. And a very cool thing that the Docker does is that it actually doesn't disclose to you that internal sort of packaging format of how these images depend on each other. And I will explain why it's important a little bit later. But we, before I go into that, uh, let me actually address one more question that people typically ask me when I talk about OSV. So especially in the context of JVM, we actually had that. We had a couple of companies that tried running JVM on bare metal, even by, before that. Uh, we had, you know, a couple of companies that tried, you know, unikernels and exokernels, all of that failed. So why is it different today? Three things, and I claim that, you know, these are the key things. There may be others, but to me, they're the, th the three things. So first of all, we've arrived at a point when Intel hardware is fully capable of hardware-assisted virtualization, the same way that old IBM systems used to be capable of, like, way back when, and we all left at them and we didn't appreciate them at all. Now we get that on Intel, now we all have it. Uh, elastic infrastructure-oriented architectures, right? Uh, what I mean by that is we now have conditioned our developers that microservices are good. So something like you know, an application that is spread into bajillion different pieces that need to be projected into a data center is now a reality. 
we actually need tools to help us manage those types of applications. And finally, we've got Cloud Foundry. So we actually have an implementation of something that can map into that sort of application infrastructure. So it's partially social, it's partially technological, but to me it boils down to these three reasons. Uh, and with that, let me actually give you my vision of Elastic Next Generation Data Center. So my beautiful vision for that is rows and rows and rows of commodity hardware, like things that I completely replace just ripping out of racks. And by the way, everything is rack provisioned. So instead of you know, buying one U or two U or three U servers and trying to figure out how much memory do I put in there, how much CPU power do I put in there, how much storage do I put in there, I basically have a rack that I can plug drives in, I have a rack that I can plug you know, CPU cards in, I have a rack that I can plug uh, my flash uh, into. On top of all of this, there is a commodity just enough OS that serves as a glorified device driver. It has no state, at least not, you know, not much of a state of its own, pretty much zero. And today we actually have good uh, examples of such projects. You know, so CoreOS, I highly recommend you know, looking at it and SmartOS, which has its lineage in Solaris, uh, are examples of something that would let me just manage the hardware, get out of the way, and get everything else done via containers and virtual machines. So all I need from my just enough OS on bare metal, let me do either Docker or OSV. Once I have that, I actually want Docker to be Docker++. I want Docker to do exactly what it's meant for, essentially being this unified packaging, socially driven, you know, shared, infrastructure for images, but the backend, I would like to be able to plug it into whatever I want. So today, Docker, you know, obviously supports Linux containers, and that's good, but there's absolutely no reason why the same concept shouldn't be applied to OSV, because OSV is kind of like I showed you, it's very much the same, it's just, you know, different combination of the same building blocks. But at the end of the day, if I'm a Docker guy, and I'm doing, you know, Docker run, and that image happens to have a bit of metadata that describes that that image actually happens to be an OSV image, why should I care? And then, of course, we need to have a GitHub for shared microservices. Just like we have a GitHub for shared uh, source code, we actually need to have a GitHub architecture for sharing all the bits and pieces of functionality that, again, you know, Pat and Chef kind of promised us we would be able to do, but they couldn't deliver. Now we actually have an option of doing that via containers and sort of these statically linked images. And finally, it will let us kill DevOps. I hate DevOps. Like, this is the worst concept ever. I mean, <laughs> This is not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, like it's not quite dev, it's not, it's not quite DevOps, it's DevOps, right? What I want from my IT, from my dev, I want to maintain my bare OS. I want them to just make sure that my core OS runs. And then I have my devs who have a very predictable environment because anything can be replicated, everything is packaged in predictable containers, and the two sort of never really talk. And if you have a next hard bleed bug, your ops guys are completely ineffective because there is no SSL installed on their core OS. Like, why would it be there? Uh, your developers, of course, are effective, but that's their business because they can fix whatever they want to their layer. Basically, I hate snowflakes. Nothing is ever a snowflake. Uh, we need to get to a very predictable provisioning model, and I think microservices deployment architecture is pretty much it. So very quickly, guinea pig so far for OSV. OSV is, by the way, a very young project. So again, like a year and a half, I guess, you know, would be sort of roughly uh, the lifespan. <laughs> so guinea pigs so far have been MemcacheD, you know, very successful results. Apache Cassandra, again, pretty successful. Redis, that's what the Cloudies guys uh, have done. So I have done uh, a little bit of experimenting with Hadoop ecosystem. So I have, you know, data nodes. Uh, I have Zookeeper, you know, thingies. And I'm actually like running out of time, you know, constantly to actually do some meaningful performance benchmarks. but. I should be. Speaking of which, uh, I'm actually hiring. So if any of this is exciting to you, uh, talk to me after the presentation. And speaking of which, even if you don't join me as a paid employee, we pay well. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> where do we need your help? It's all open source, right? You know, just join. You know, start posting on GitHub. You know, start sending out pull requests. And just you know to keep you thinking. Uh, Cloud Foundry integration, you know, things that are really super exciting to me, right? It's like, can I do CF push Docker container? It would be awesome if I could. There is absolutely no reason. I think there is no reason I should be able to do that. So, you know, sounds like a good idea. Shouldn't then Docker images be kind of like this intermediate uh, 
you know, representation for the build packs. Because again, you know, the problem with build packs, at least I had, you know, some time ago, is like, well, the build pack runs, and then the whole bunch of things happen. Like, my application got transformed into something, but I don't quite know what that something is, and I don't quite know how to replicate that something. So if we can actually use Docker, sort of the shared, you know, microservices image uh, repository as a backend for uh, build packs, maybe that's a good idea. I don't know, you tell me. Uh, Two-level scheduling into the biggest system. I mean, that's how Google sort of approached it, at least for the second generation architecture. So you have, you know, this microservices container or uh, OSV-based uh, units. You basically stand them up, and all of a sudden you have your own Hadoop cluster. So maybe that's a good idea. Um, and I guess I'm out of time, but questions? Well, this is, by the way, a really nice talk. Thank you very much. I have to say, I'm really excited about what this means for my Minecraft server performance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, could, could you comment? You, you, had, you were trying to clean a vision of your next gen style. I think OpenStack was significantly missing from your, yes. from your commentary. And I, I'm wondering where you imagine the actual capacity management of what, like what stuff gets run where based on what hardware is being used and not being used. Right, so the question is, you know, why didn't I, didn't I say much about OpenStack? So to me, OpenStack will obviously still exist, right, you know. Uh, what I'm talking about is the data center optimized for the microservices-based deployments. Uh, there will be a class of applications, just like there's a class of applications that we still need, you know, very classical virtualization for. So like, you know, VMware is, you know, well known for virtualizing your, you know, Windows XP, right? You know, it's like, if you still need that, I mean, there has to be a solution for that. So uh, OpenStack, CloudStack, those types of technologies will remain at the level of infrastructure of the service. But my belief is that we as development community have sort of moved above that layer. So there will be still tasks for which infrastructure of the service is absolutely the right thing to do. But most of the time, the next generation applications that we develop will actually follow the microservices deployment model where infrastructure doesn't actually factor in. And at that point, you're absolutely right. You still have to have some kind of orchestration layer. And like I said at the beginning of the presentation, that is completely missing from you know, this talk. I actually hope that that would end up being Cloud Foundry natively. But if there are bits and pieces of Cloud Stack, sort of open stack, mixed into that, that may be fine as well. Uh, what I'm trying to say is at that point, you're basically having a pass as a thing that you actually run in your data center. So your data center starts to look like pass. Whereas today, you know, your data center, actually your good data center, still looks like you know infrastructure as a service. And I think you know that step will be made in like next you know, three, five years. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, so you're not talking about the hardware that Yeah, so multi-core is supported, so the question is what hardware is supported. So it's definitely x86, multi-core is supported, so you can have threads being uh, scheduled on uh, as many cores as you want. I believe that there is a port to ARM in the works, uh, so ARM will be supported pretty soon. Hopefully, again, open source project joining, it'll help. Uh, but I don't know if there's any other architecture, so Dor, do you want to comment? Probably more of a mission than some, like KVM, we were the one that's created the VMware platform, and pretty much all the other features, including mainframe, but uh, adopted KVM, so we hope in this case, they have the VMware platform. Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I have a, I have an old friend of mine, like he is old, he happens to be an old friend of mine. Uh, who used to work at IBM, and you know, when I talked to him about this stuff, he's like, oh, kids, youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much.